things are possible, right? Like if you're sitting in the larynx, then yes, if you expand it, you probably won't see dilatation. So so a little bit of it is is corresponding to what is my actual measurement that I'm at? Like, does it make sense clinically that I would be too high or too low? And obviously then you have to kind of, you know, modify what you're doing to try and find that. Now, this is why the next thing we'll talk about works a little bit better for that because this is more about specifically knowing exactly where the cuff is because we're using the ultrasound physics behind it. So this is Mark Tassaro's study, so who's one of our eMERGE staff here. Um, and so when he was in uh, Maimonides in uh, New York, um, he, he did this study uh, to sort of um, throw his hat into the ring of uh, you know, figuring out where the, the tube is within the trachea and, and being as valid as possible. So the idea is this, right? So this is our standard setup of a, um, a patient with a tube in place. So you've got their trachea, which is the big circle there, and you've got a tube in place with a sort of cuff that's surrounding it, right? And whether that cuff is there or it expands, you're going to get something that kind of looks like this, right? You're going to get shadowing behind there because you just got air in the way and you're gonna get that appearance right there, right? Now, what if you, instead of inflating that cuff with air, actually inflate it with um, water? So in this case, you're gonna fill <laughs> saline or water into that cuff, and for the person who asks, is that safe? Mark did speak to all the manufacturers and blah, blah, blah. He talked to all the reps and got all the approval from you know the industry, and so apparently it is very safe to do you will still get people who, you know, will be like, well, you shouldn't, that's not where that goes. I mean, we do this all the time with, with you know, flu like the bladder and, and putting fluid into, into that cuff um, or into things like the um, G-tubes to try to find out where their position is with radiographic dyes. Those things happen all the time and they're, and they're considered to be very safe. Um, but people, I think, worry that in a tube that's going to be in there for a long, long time, is this somehow going to you know, exceed the manufacturing capacity of it and rupture your cuff or something like that. As far as Mark understood from his speaking with industry, that was not an issue. So now you've got your cuff expanded with fluid. What are you expecting to see now if you look on ultrasound? Air surrounded by a rim. Perhaps, yes. So, so what happens when it, when ultrasound beam goes through water or fluid? You get an acoustic enhancement, right? And it goes through air, you get a shadowing behind. So you get something like this, where you've got shadowing through that tube and you've got an acoustic enhancement beyond it. Can you guys kind of appreciate that on the screen here, that you've got acoustic enhancement here, here, you've got, um, and then you've got this, um, edge artifact that comes down off the side of the trachea on either side, and then of course an artifact that comes through an air-filled tube. So a little bit nicer as compared to some of the other te techniques of a pattern that you're looking for, right? A, a sort of visual pattern that really is only seen in this specific circumstance, right? Unless your trachea is filled with water for some reason, this is the only situation where you're going to see this kind of appearance. Um, and if we watch it in real time, there's also another appreciable thing, which is the mm -hmm. fact that you can see the actual fluid coming in, right? And so there's a 100% guarantee in your brain that I am looking at the cuff. The only thing that's filling with fluid here is the cuff. So if I watch this over and over again, I can convince myself that's a cuff expanding. So now I can say with 100% certainty that underneath my ultrasound probe, there is a cuff and it's filling with fluid. And if you have a cuff underneath your ultrasound probe at that area just above the thoracic inlet, in his study at least, in both adults and children, 100% of the time, it was correlated with a tube that was in the right place. I think there was one patient where something happened. I can't remember what the issue was. Um, I wish Mark was here to tell us, but there was one issue. So basically on his study, they, they looked. I think that uh, yes. all the images were uh, seen afterward yeah. by some uh, radiology slash because people, I'm not sure. And they were misdiagnosing uh, the Right. So that's why then they ended up with something that's not 100%. Right. So so it was just somebody like so as close to 100% as you can get in a study. In their study, they they basically compared lung sliding versus this to see what you know the kind of correlation was, and their sensitivity for lung sliding was quite low, so 56%. Um, and specificity is 92%, and this is combining the, the study done by Sim as well with, I think, the lung sliding result there. Um, and then the fluid cuff was 96 to 99, and then 99% for specificity, so very, very precise. 
and the time is much different, right? If anyone's done lung, lung sliding before, it's very nice when we're sitting in this dark room and we're looking at an image and we're like, oh, look at that. Do you think you see lung sliding? Do you think you don't see lung sliding? But calling no lung sliding at the clinical bedside in a bright room with a bunch of people around while you're doing it in a sort of suboptimal kind of environment is a lot more challenging than we sometimes like to admit. And so, you know, it, it doesn't surprise that it takes a little bit longer than perhaps we would want it to, 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 to sort of be very clear about that technique. Furthermore, if, if you're thinking about this in a, in a setting of somewhere like anesthesia, you may not have access to their chest, right? So you may not have access. Certainly no one's usually taking the neck away from them unless it's an ENT surgery, but um, you may not necessarily be able to put the probe on their chest, you know, in a sterile fashion. So this, this fluid cuff way seems, at least from the literature, to be the most um, optimal way of actually seeing um, whether someone's got, uh, you know, some, some uh, uh, tube in the right position, but, but there may be other methods uh, we've yet to sort of figure out or whatever, but uh, this seems to be the best one. And, uh, you know, I would say that um, keeping in mind that um, you're putting fluid in the cuff, the industry seems to support it. So we've had a lot of hard times actually doing this here because it just weirds people out, but that's often the case with, with these sorts of things that are kind of a bit game changing. Okay, we've talked about airway. You guys are happy with esophageal intubations and tracheal. Let's talk about surgical airway briefly. So this is a three-year-old that unfortunately was playing with a mean horse, kicked in the face, unconscious. He's got a very distorted looking face. Sats are 40%, can't get his airway in view on laryngoscopy. So what are you gonna do right now? You're praying hard and you are trying to find an airway. So airway ultrasound um, for surgical airways is, is basically gonna be using the technique you're seeing here. So you're gonna be putting your probe along the neck looking for the sort of classic signs of those cartilaginous structures as well as the airway to identify a cricothyroid membrane. Why does this matter? Because in a lot of our kids, or in me, for example, you can feel it really easily, and that's great. Well, some of our kids look like this, and some of our older babies kind of look like this. So it's, it's difficult sometimes to appreciate those structures and, you know, trying to get to the um, you know, airway is not always as easy as just feeling for a cricothyroid membrane. So on ultrasound, what are we seeing? Well, we're gonna see something that kind of looks like this in diagram format. So you've got a thyroid cartilage that kind of jumps out and it tends to be a bit bonier than the, the cricoid cartilage in terms of the amount of um, uh, obstruction to the, the ultrasound beam. And then between those two things is obviously the cricothyroid membrane. What this, what this image doesn't show as well is that you've got those further cricoid rings that come down, kind of like a little uh, chain of pearls. Um, and we'll see that through some of the next few images. So this is your image on the left in sort of raw format. And if you look here, you've got a more pronounced um, cartilaginous structure. And then you've now got these little small guys, which are the really the, the cartilaginous um, uh, little tra oh, the tracheal rings as they're coming around. And then that area between this structure, which is your, your thyroid cartilage, and that cricoid cartilage is the cricothyroid membrane. Try this out at the bedside. Sometimes it can be a bit challenging to first do, so it's one of those things that you should practice a few times before making um, you know, yourself certain. Um, and again, here's another example of it. So seeing that prominent cricoid cartilage with the thyroid above it, and then those smaller rings corresponding and then this area here being the area that we're interested in going into. I mean, at the end of the day, we're typically going to do needle cricothyroidotomies. So it's, you could go to a lot of different places. You don't have to go with a cricothyroid membrane, but obviously that's the position that we're optimally aiming for. And if we look really closely, this is kind of how it would look there too. Um, I don't have any good dynamic videos. There's a few online of showing people dynamically intubating. The other inherent benefit here would be depth. It's not something we think of a lot because the structures tend to be very close to the surface, but if you're putting a needle into a patient that's much bigger, um, sometimes you have to think about, oh, am I going like six centimeters deep with this needle or something crazy? And, uh, you know, being able to use the ultrasound to tell how deep you're going and not going you know, through and through the, the trachea is actually one of the other benefits of, of using the ultrasound as well. 